Hello, scientists. My name is Karen. I've been teaching science in Seattle for the past 12 years, and really there's nothing I'd rather be doing. I usually plan my vacations around science things, like I went last year to Argentina to see their total solar eclipse. And this is actually a, a picture of me being interviewed by the news. They wondered why I would travel all the way from Seattle to come to the little town of Rio Corto to watch the solar eclipse. And I told them it was worth it. So incredible. I also love to travel to the southwest area of the United States. I love the red rocks and find all of the rock formations there to be pretty incredible. This lesson is for grade six. It's lesson one of the unit oceans, atmosphere, and climate. So there's a couple of things you're going to need. One, it would be helpful if you had something to write on and with. I have just a pen and a notebook that I can write some notes on. So um, let me make sure I've got, oh yeah, lots and lots of space. So let me get started with that. It's also really helpful if you have someone to talk to, if you have someone in your house that you can just have around so that when you need to think about some things, you have someone to just discuss your ideas with. Scientists always find it is so helpful to discuss things with other scientists as they're thinking about ideas. Um, or you could text or DM a friend that's also in sixth grade and have them watch the lesson with you and then you can do it at the same time and that could really up your game a little bit about how great the science can be. Okay, let's get started. In this video, you will meet scientists who are researching air temperatures in different places and what it is that can make air temperature change. As you watch the video, you can I'm take I'm Marty Herling. I'm a climate airport. scientist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in Boulder, Colorado, and I study El Nino. El Nino has some puzzling aspects to it. It lasts six, 12 months. It returns maybe every two to seven years. When El Nino happens, the ocean temperatures change and the air temperatures change over the whole planet. And they can change by, oh, almost two tenths of degrees Celsius, almost a half degree Fahrenheit. And that kind of change, you might say, well, that's not very big, but actually it is big and we can see it happening. El Nino is something that causes radical changes. Some places get way too much rain and they get flooded out and it can be damages to homes. Some areas that normally get rain, suddenly the rain shut down. They get fires, drought, their crops don't grow, a lot of problems. We had this big El Nino this past year. It was so big that we decided within NOAA to go out and hunt it down, take new measurements to see how it ticked. We combine planes, ships, we go to remote islands, we launch balloons. My name is Dan Wolf. I'm a research meteorologist and I was part of the El Nino Rapid Response Project. The ship traveled from Hawaii to the equator collecting ocean temperature and also releasing weather balloons as we went. The data are transmitted real time back to a computer on the ship where we can watch it, then we can send it back to Boulder where modelers use it to help better understand the weather and El Nino. I'm Dr. Leslie Harton. I'm a research meteorologist and this spring I spent five weeks on a small island called Christmas Island in the equatorial Pacific and we went there to launch weather balloons. Christmas Island is in a part of the world where there are almost no regular weather observations and it's also right at the heart of the El Nino that was happening this year. We launched our weather balloons at 1.15 in the morning and 1.15 in the afternoon. An instrument package like this is attached to the weather balloon and as the balloon goes up we measure temperature and humidity and winds and pressure. Our data give us a really unique picture of how the atmosphere is behaving in that region when there is a strong El Nino. Hey Honolulu, this is Boulder and we're ready to go through the briefing this morning. So every day um, the aircraft would have to fly out from Hawaii to the equator to get some idea of what El Nino was doing. Kelly, do you expect both radars on board to be active to help you um, through that convection? Yeah, thanks Marty. We should have both radars working on today's flight, so that will be a big help. I'm Dr. Kelly Mahoney, and I served as a mission scientist for the El Nino Rapid Response Project aboard the NOAA Research Aircraft. 
We had manned aircraft with the whole flight crew aboard it, and then an unmanned aircraft. And the mission of both of these aircrafts was to go out and get close enough to thunderstorms that we could either circle around them or get close enough to feel some of the winds that were coming out of them. As we got close to the thunderstorms, our job was to drop instrument packets out of the airplane to measure the temperature, moisture, and wind speeds right around the thunderstorms. The data that we collected is truly unique and very useful and valuable to our weather and climate models. So I really like doing this science um, because we're trying to understand the way El Nino works. The ocean and the atmosphere, how they link. It affects weather patterns. Many people's lives are really affected by this. And that's really why the data are so important. It helps us make better forecasts and helps people's lives. So as I watched that video, I took a couple of notes. I'm, I'm sure you did too. Um, right now, if there's someone at your house or if you have a friend that you are texting, why don't you take a moment to share some of the things that you noticed in the video or some things that you might have wondered about or some things that you saw. While you're doing that, I'm going to look over my notes and then share a few with you in a moment. So a few things that I wrote down and maybe you did too, they mentioned something called El Nino and um, and then talked about how scientists are studying it. I hear a lot about climate change in the news. I hear about global warming. So I wonder if El Nino is connected with that or if it's something else. And I, they also mentioned that it happens every two to seven years. That seems like that's happened a lot. And then it seems like sometimes it happens frequently and then less frequently. So I wonder about that. And also, I was interested in the science scientists who were mentioning that they sent up instruments with weather balloons, and one of them mentioned something called an instrument packet, and I just wondered what kind of instruments were in the instrument packet and how they use a weather balloon to measure temperature and air pressure. I think they mentioned that those were some of the things that they were interested in. I also thought it was interesting that the same thing, El Nino, can affect the planet in different ways, some places with too much rain, some places with droughts and fires. So I'm, I'm definitely interested in, in learning more about that. You know the title for this unit is Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate. So let's talk about what the word climate means. Climate isn't the same as weather. Weather is something like today it's sunny, which it totally is, or it's rainy or something like that. But climate is looking at those weather patterns as they happen over and over and over a period of time, years, decades, centuries. And so the climate of a location might be um, different than the weather. You could have a warm, sunny day in Seattle, that's the weather, but you wouldn't necessarily describe warm and sunny as the, the climate of Seattle. You might say it's more temperate, um, cloudy, lots of days and rainy and warm temperatures, but not hot. Another word that we heard in the video is climatologists. So let's read what this says. Climatologists study temperature over time. So they're the ones that are actually studying, but over a long period of time, that's essential to understand. Instead of trying to explain why the temperature today is different from the temperature yesterday, a climate scientist might try to explain why the average temperature this year is warmer or cooler than last year. So in the video, they mentioned um, balloon launches. So I, I thought it would be cool to show you this picture. This is a picture that was taken by the NASA Wallops flight facility. And um, it just talks about how they're launching it. Um, and it's quite big. You can see how huge this weather balloon is compared to the semi that's down here filling it with air. That's pretty cool. So this it says it's at Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and it's carrying the Langley Research Center radiation dosimetry experiment. So I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's pretty cool to, to think of all the things that weather balloons are able to do. During this unit, we are going to try to solve this problem. And let's start by reading this email that um, it's going to be your job as a student climatologist to try to figure out the answer to it as we go throughout these lessons. So this email comes from Kitty Parada, and um, it's the 
The subject of the email is influences on Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature. And you'll notice at the top right that there is um, kind of a logo that says it's from the New Zealand Farm Council. Okay, I am the director of the New Zealand Farm Council. Our organization represents farmers in the area surrounding Christchurch. Every few years, we notice climate changes that affect the crops. During El Nino years, the air temperature is much cooler than usual, and we would like to learn why. So the farmers are better prepared for the, these temperature changes. We are asking you, our student climatologist, to conduct some research on what determines Christchurch's air temperature, especially why it decreases during El Nino. Looking forward to working with you and hearing what you find out. Kitty, and it says here that Kitty Parada is the director of the New Zealand Farm Council. Okay, so I have a couple of things that I'd want to talk about um, as I look over this email. One, where is Christchurch, New Zealand? And so if you look here at this world map, you can see that New Zealand, which is here in red, is a country that looks like it's made of two main islands. And then there's a yellow star here that shows you where it is. And um, in this picture here, you can see the top and bottom islands of New Zealand. And then there's a red dot here that represents where Christchurch is at. I've been to New Zealand and I did get to go to Christchurch and I did notice a lot of farms. I didn't go specifically to be ready for this video lesson to share with you today, but I did get to go there two years ago. And some of the pictures here are from the North Island and some are from the South Island. And one of the things that I noticed when I was there, it was summer, so it was warmer. And I did see lots and lots of farms, so I know that they probably also get a lot of rain. This is a picture that was my favorite one I took in New Zealand. It was beautiful. Like Seattle, they have um, a sound. <clears throat> this is called Milford Sound, and we have our Puget Sound nearby. They have lots of mountains, just like us. So climatologists use the term atmosphere to describe the mixture of gases or air that surround our planet. Planet Earth is surrounded with a lot of oxygen, which helps us to breathe, and also a lot of nitrogen and some other gases that are pretty small, like water vapor and carbon dioxide. In this unit, we'll be investigating the air right above the surface. And if you'll notice on the right side of the screen, there's this graphic here that I put on just to help us understand that it's not the air that's really high up in the atmosphere, but it's just the air that sort of surrounds the farm. So if you were walking around the air that's just right above you, if you flew as high as an airplane, that would be air that's a little bit too far to affect the atmosphere around the farm. So when we talk about Christchurch air temperature, we are talking about the temperature of the air directly above Christchurch. I think it's also important that we recognize that there's a surface and then there's the air above it. So lots of things have a surface like tables, chairs, desks, all those things. But when we refer to Earth's surface, we could be referring to land. We could also be referring to water. So even though the ocean is liquid, it's the surface of the Earth. A lot of the surface of the Earth is covered with water. So during El Nino years, why is Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature cooler than usual? When scientists like climatologists get data, outside of the expected pattern that they're used to seeing, like with El Nino, it often leads them to investigate the cause of this unusual data. So your job is to work as a student climatologist to investigate why Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual during air temperature. I mean, during El Nino years. Right now would be a great point to pause the video if you are watching it online and either text or DM your friend or call over someone in your house who maybe is sitting right there with you or maybe in another room and just pause it and think about why you think this might be happening. What could be a reason? And you could get your notebook out and jot down just a few ideas. As we go through all the lessons, you're gonna come to a deep understanding and be able to explain this, but it's a good idea always before you start to think about what do you think might be causing this temperature to be different. Okay, so I have a couple of thoughts and I hope that you do too, and I wish we could talk to each other right now, but I'll go ahead and tell you some of my ideas and hopefully you've had a chance to write down a few of yours. So when I think about the temperature of the air, I think it could be that something's happening to the air, like maybe it's changing, maybe it has 
uh, less air or more air. So there could be something actually changing to the air itself around New Zealand during El Nino um, or something with the wind. So that's in the air. I also wonder if there's something happening with the sun. Um, I noticed that they mentioned that there is this pattern that happens over and over again every two to seven years. So I wonder, does the sun change every two to seven years? And the sun is what heats the earth, right? So it seems like that would be huge. That would make a big difference. I also wonder if there's something happening like with the surface itself. I noticed that New Zealand is surrounded by a lot of ocean. And so maybe something's happening with the ocean surface, um, like a change in temperature, maybe a change in the way that the ocean is, um, is made of or how it moves around. And, or the surface of the land itself. I, in the pictures I showed you of New Zealand, one of the things I noticed when I was there was there were a lot of mountains. So maybe the, the surface of the earth is changing. Maybe there's, the mountains are changing shape like because of volcanoes or something to do with the land itself. So it could be any of those ideas. So I summarized some of my thoughts into th three main ideas, three claims that could answer the question. So the first one is that the amount of incoming energy from the sun is changing. And you'll remember from a last unit that energy is one of the, the words that we studied in the thermal energy unit and some other units. Uh, my second idea is maybe something about the earth's surface is changing, either the land um, or the water. And then the last one is something about the air is changing. And so those are three ideas about what could be causing this to happen. Okay, so this is a screenshot of the SIM that we get to use during the Ocean's Atmosphere and Climate Unit. And um, there's a lot of cool things to explore. So if you have um, access to a computer or a tablet or even a phone where you can get onto the onto Amplify and go to the SIM, then I would encourage you to explore that after I'm done giving a couple of directions. And if, if you don't, if you're watching this video and you don't really have a computer or tab tablet handy, it's okay because I'm going to explore it and you can watch a video of me um, showing you all the cool features and the things that we can we can discover. So the, the, the question that we're going to be looking at is since Christchurch New Zealand's temperature changes during El Nino years, we first need to figure out what can cause temperature to change at all. So we're going to use the sim just to determine how to change the air temperature. Like how can we get the, the temperature to change either to go up or down? So to get to the sim, you would go to your Amplify account the way that you would normally get there at school or at home. And remember to open up the, the menu in the top left corner and scroll down until you see the sim that's called Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate. And then go ahead and click on that and open it up. I'm going to go ahead and do that myself so that I can show you a little bit of the things that you can discover. And you can do that. Um, come back to this video when you're done. And um, also, I would really encourage you, if you're able to, to have someone nearby that you can discuss some of the things that you're noticing in the sim, either FaceTime a friend or get um, someone in your house that you can be around to, to do this with you. Or if you want to explore it by yourself, that's also totally fine. Okay, so from Amplify, from the page, go ahead and open up the the menu. I like to call it the hamburger menu because it looks like a bun and a middle filling and a bottom bun, but you can call it the global um, navigation menu as I think what it's called. Okay, so here we are, oceans, atmosphere, and climate, and then we just have to wait for it to load. Hopefully it loads quickly, but during the time that it's loading, oh, it's already done. I was going to tell you that you could write down some of the things that you want to check out. So. As I'm looking at this, I can see a couple of things. One, there's a menu in the sim itself, and it has four different modes. There's the current map, the wind map, the energy test, and the surface test. And what I'm trying to explore right now is just how can you get the temperature um, to change, um, the air temperature to change. I noticed that there's something here called temperature view. You can have none, or you could have air. Oh, that's interesting. That makes some bars show up in some different colors. When I look at this temperature menu at the top, I can see the, um, the different temperatures and it looks like the equator is red, which makes it seem like it's warmer than, um, 
the top or the bottom of the screen. I also notice that over here there's like numbers like zero degrees, 30 degrees north, 60 degrees north, 90 degrees north, and then the other way, but south, 30 south, 90 south down here. And then there's also some across the bottom that seem to be numbers with west and east. Um, so I can also see there's a prompt up here saying click play to start. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Oh, this is weird. Uh, it looks like things are kind of getting strange, a little pixely. I'm curious to know what it looks like um, with the nun. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's a bunch of little white lines moving around. And what if I go to surface? Oh, interesting. How is that different than air? Let's see, air temperatures, you can't see those little white lines, but if I go to surface, I can. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out how I can get the air temperature to change. And I, I notice a couple of things that are interesting here. It seems like the surface temperature is colder at the top of the screen and also at the bottom of the screen. I also notice that the, um, in the map, I, these shapes here, D, A, B, C, um, seem to be, the white lines don't seem to be moving on those, which makes me think that those are, that's land, and the other part is actually water, is liquid water. And down here, it looks like there's land here and here at the top. I think it's interesting that the land here seems so much colder than the water that's just next to it. I would have expected at the, what, this is the North Pole, I would have expected that to be the same temperature in the water and the land, but the, the water seems a little warmer. Um, I'm gonna go to none, and when I click on none, I can't see the temperatures, but I think for us, leaving the surface temperature is on is better because it helps us to see how the temperature is different places in different parts of the world. This doesn't quite look like planet Earth. Planet Earth doesn't have continents that look like this, these four shapes. But with models, lots of times scientists use models to show how something can behave. And it might not be exactly the same as Earth, but it's a planet um, that seems to behave in a lot of the same ways that Earth does and that the continents seem to be staying still and the water seems to be able to move around them. I'm gonna click on air and I notice that um, there's, this is definitely different than when we started. When we started there, this line here on the equator was all red and it was the same temperature. And when I look at it now, I can see that there seems to be a few, sorry about that, a few different places that are actually getting further away from that initial red. There's some darker red that seems to be piling up here next to continent A. There seems to be some kind of piling up here on this side of continent C, but it's weird because on this side of continent C, it's it's like oranger than, than the dark red that it was. So that's interesting. And I also notice up here that um, the temperatures here are a little warmer than they were before when I first started. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to pause it, and I want you to remember that this up here is sort of looks like it's a little greener than just blue, and if I reset and I go back to reset current map, I'll say yeah. If I go here to the air temperature before we start, we can see that this is dark blue. But a second ago when we looked at it, it was actually there was water temperature like this that had moved all the way up there. So that's that's interesting. Okay, so there's a couple of the things it looks like I can do. Let me hit play again. It says I can turn off the sun. And if I turn off the sun, I think I would expect the whole planet to get colder if our sun totally stopped. And as I look at this, I, I do notice that it looks like the poles are getting a darker, darker blue than they were before. The continents themselves seem to be turning blue. There's still quite a lot of heat in the middle, but even that, I'm starting to notice the blues and the yellows and the greens are moving towards the equator. The equator itself seems to be cooling down. It's orange now instead of red. And some places are starting to turn a little light orange and maybe even a yellow. So, wow, that makes me wonder if El Nino has something to do with the sun, if the temperatures are changing because of that. I'm gonna turn the sun back on though, because that seems really cold. Okay, welcome back. There were a lot of cool things in the sim that we can explore. And 
I spend most of my time exploring the current map mode, although I didn't open up the sensor locations during my exploration because I plan to do that in a later lesson. And I also didn't look a lot at energy test mode, but maybe you did. And if you did, awesome. And if you didn't, it's okay because again, we will explore that in much more depth at a later lesson. So when we were collecting evidence from the sim, either today as we just explored it or later on in the unit, we'll go back many times and collect more evidence. We're trying to figure out a couple of key things in our understanding of El Nino. We want to collect evidence from the sim to answer our unit questions. So how did you make the temperature increase? How did you make the temperature decrease? Where does the energy in the air and the water come from? So there's a couple of vocabulary words that would be review for most of you watching this video. One of them is energy, which is the ability to make things move or change. And the other one is temperature, which is a measure of how hot or cold something is. So I'm going to ask you to come back to these three questions and pull out your notebook. I've got my, mine right here and a pen. And I want you to write down the answers to these three questions. How did you make the temperature increase? And I have an idea of what my answer will be, but I want to hear your answers. And so write those down and then hopefully we'll have a, an opportunity to discuss that later on in another, another lesson. But make sure you answer all three questions. I think you should pause the video right here if you need to, or you can, um, you can use a, a printout notebook if you got one of those. If you, you could get one from your science teacher or you can go to your science teacher's Schoology page to answer some of these questions there. Okay, this has been great. Thanks so much.